and welcome back to Viewbridge on 120. I am Jeff Flint, and this is a series of 120 videos of things that I learned as a student at the University of Virginia. And today we're going to be talking about, uh, and actually for the next three videos, going to be talking about uh, different kinds of reason, uh, specifically deductive and inductive types of reason. And so today we're specifically going to be talking about inductive reasoning of a certain kind, uh, specifically mathematical induction. Uh, and we're going to go and get into the details in a little bit. Uh, but just to kind of warn you ahead of time that there are these three different types of reasoning. Uh, mathematical induction is something that's going to be used in computer science a lot. Uh, so it's kind of worth talking about first. Uh, but just to give you a heads up, there is a difference between mathematical induction and regular induction. Uh, unfortunately, these are just the two terms that uh, academics have come up to, to talk about these things with. Uh, so there is a bit of confusion because of the word induction there. Uh, but rest assured, there, there is a, a little bit of a difference, uh, and we're specifically talking about mathematical induction. So the good news uh, is that mathematical induction is relatively easy. Once you get the idea, uh, as long as the, the problem that you're looking at uh, can be done at all with mathematical induction, uh, usually it's, it's not that difficult to kind of pull this method off, to to use mathematical induction itself. Uh, it's a little bit more difficult to describe how it works, uh, but I'm going to do a bit of a, a shot at it today. Uh, as mentioned, there, there's a difference between induction and mathematical induction. Uh, if you go through the MIT Open Courseware uh, videos on logic and deduction, you'll they want you to be able to do mathematical induction in your sleep. It's probably not as important that you be able to do regular induction in your sleep. Uh, but of course, if you can do things in your sleep, all the better. Uh, mathematical induction is strictly speaking stronger than induction, as far as the, the, the certainty of your conclusion. Uh, but uh, it is less used in practice, uh, although, as mentioned, kind of more used in computer science than a lot of other things. Also worth pointing out, I'm going to be using the term NAND a lot in this video, uh, or at least in the next couple of mi minutes. Uh, so if you don't know what NAND is, and you haven't seen my video on NAND, uh, kind of pause, go watch that video, or quickly go Google what NAND is, uh, because you'll very quickly get lost otherwise. And so you can view how mathematical induction works on a couple of different ways. The most complicated way, and again, if you want to kind of skip over this part, uh, you know, feel free to, although this is one of the ways you can look at it, uh, is that it's just an axiom. It's a way of relating, uh, I guess, what, or ways a predicate behaves. And when I say predicate, I mean something, say, P of N, where, I'm not sure if you can actually see that, but, there we go, so P of N, uh, and n is usually a number or some, some kind of uh, range of things or, or a collection of things that p, this relationship p, can be true or false on. So for example, uh, p could be is red and n could be uh, thing, articles of clothing that I'm wearing. Uh, so that's not a number per se, but it's a ge really general thing. Is this red? No. You know, this red? No. This pants red? No. And so if you point to every you know, particular thing, uh, that I'm wearing, uh, this kind of function or predicate will give you a true or a false value for it. Uh, and so if we could say that n is a number, uh, p could be, uh, is this number even or odd? Uh, and if it's even, assign it true. If it's odd, assign it false. So you assign n to be 1, uh, then it would be odd, so it would be false, and so on and so forth. And so we can view how mathematical induction works. This may take a couple moments to describe.
That's not so bad. A lot better than yesterday. You should be at home resting. Arduino, so you can keep it up off of the desk and level. And so this is the uh, selection or the, the way of expressing the axiom purely by means of the NAND no operation. Uh, and so this is something that you can write out. Hopefully the video actually captures the whole thing. Uh, but it is very complicated to write out only right using the NAND operation. So if you have other operations that you can use and other Boolean connectors that you can use, uh, then you'll obviously be able to write this in a much more succinct way. Um, so how it's going to work in general, and I'll leave this up for a couple of moments so that you can kind of pause the video here and write this down if you care to. There we go. we prove what's that P is true for some number. Uh, you can start with zero, you can start with one, uh, as long as your uh, domain that you're proving it on is going to be greater than this number, kind of aim for the lowest number uh, that you have access to, unless you want to go the other way, you could do this by you kind of proving less than, uh, but for, for just a way of looking at it, you prove for some number that P of that number is true. And then you prove that if some number is true, or if p of that number is true, or sorry, if, if p of some number is true, then that, that necessarily implies pn plus 1 is also true. And you do this often enough by substituting in the pn plus 1 in place of pn, which we'll show you how to do in just a bit. Uh, but again, it, this is going to be called the base case, and this is going to be called the inductive step. Uh, so that the step that's inductive is where you're basically proving or using the fact that is general uh, to make a conclusion. So let this this is kind of uh, again we kind of showed what it looks like in a kind of abstract level and show you the general overview. Let's look at an example to get this clear of how this actually works. So if you're just adding numbers together, uh, there's a relationship between the, the sums of numbers added together, where the numbers are increasing by 1 in each case. So 1 plus 2 is 3, 1 plus 2 plus 3 is 6, uh, 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 is 10, and so on. And so is there a relationship between these numbers and these numbers? And it turns out that there is. Uh, I'm going to give you the relationship without proof first, and then we're going to see if we can prove it. So the relationship is n times n plus 1 divided by 2. So for example, if n is 1, then 1 times n plus 1, which is 1 plus 1, which is 2, divided by 2, is 1. And then 1 plus 2, so if n here is 2, 2 times 2 plus 1, so it's 3 times 2, divided by 2, 3 times 2, divided by 2 is 3. There we go. So at least for the first two examples, this generates sensible answers. But is there a way to prove that this is always true? And indeed there is. So first of all, we're going to ask, is this true for case? Let's, let's start with 1. And as we saw before, 1, 1 plus 1, 
which is what the first one is. So one on its own, the sum of numbers up until one is one. So this is true. So let's try to find if n substitute in n plus 1 here. are equal. So we have now proved that if you plug in n plus 1 into the original formula and then have the original formula of n here plus the next number, which is just another way of expressing this n plus 1, then uh, these two are equal. They're two different ways of looking at the same thing. Because they're equal, we know that this is valid for n plus 1 and that it implies n to n plus 1. Uh, might be a little bit of a roundabout way, but it's important to note that this proof had two steps. I erased the first step. The first step was proving that it was true for the number 1. And then this uh, assumes that it's true for n plus 1. And this, uh, again, is, is, or rather, given this n, it, that it's true for n. Because if, if it's true for n, then this is valid, and the next number in the series or in the sequence uh, is going to be n plus one. The sum of those two is going to be equal to this if this implies this. So again, it's a little bit of a roundabout way of proving things, but it is kind of handy because there are some things you can only prove in this manner. Uh, it's useful, or this type of proof is useful when you're trying to prove things uh, about all kinds of some group or some collection. Uh, and so that's going to be something we are to for that. And as with other videos, this is related to some of the other things we've talked about. Uh, it's relating to uh, George Paglia uh, in that he used this method uh, as a way to relate the difference between problems to solve or what he calls problems to solve and problems to prove. Uh, I'm not going to get into exactly what I meant by that, but uh, it's kind of worth considering uh, that this is going to be related to the, the relationship between proofs and things or examples that you could come up with or, or uh, solutions to problems that the proofs are relevant to. And it, uh, he's got a quote from on this topic, quote, In mathematics, as in the physical sciences, we may use observation and induction to discover general laws. But there is a difference. In the physical sciences, there is no, high, no higher authority than observation and induction. But in mathematics, there is such an authority, rigorous proof. And so when you get to this point where you're actually proving relationships based on the meaning of, um, kind of equality and the, the relationships between numbers themselves, uh, this is something that is going to be true no matter what the number is, no matter uh, kind of your number system, etc. Uh, this is a truth within uh, the realm of mathematics, uh, and it's 
a kind of very high high level of, of certainty is involved in this kind of proof. Uh, much, much higher than you get by just observation alone, which we're going to be talking about in the next video. Uh, this is going to be related to the slippery slope bells, uh, because there are going to be ways of getting this kind of or this kind of argument wrong. Uh, and in particular, uh, the uh, ways in which uh, these kinds of connectives are, are true or not, uh, when you fail to get them right, you end up creating slippery slope fallacy like uh, arguments uh, for them, where you're kind of missing a step where this is always true, or with, where this equality is always the case. And so you have to be kind of careful about that. Um, and so again, there's, there's a difference between uh, likeliness and certainty. Uh, and so if this is, you know, you can express this only in terms of things that are absolutely certain. Uh, it's related to uh, the 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 video, as we kind of showed. Uh, this is a pattern, relate this particular proof is a pattern related between a very simple uh, kind of pattern, this 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus whatever, but you can imagine that more complicated patterns are going to have other proofs that show that the pattern is uh, the way that you would kind of perceive it to be. And so anytime you're, pretty much anytime you're perceiving a pattern, there's going to be one of these kinds of proof hiding in the background, uh, waiting for you to make it to show that that is exactly the pattern that you're trying to talk about. It's related to circular reasoning and recursion because this is, in fact, uh, a recursive step. You're using the next step as part of your argument in the current step. Uh, so you're kind of mixing levels of, of your, your kind of argument in that way. Uh, it's related to the can you use the result video. Because once you have this relationship, you can use it in later proofs. And so you don't have to write out this whole proof every time you make a proof. If you wanted to prove what happens, for example, for 1 squared plus 2 squared plus 3 squared, etc., you may end up using this. Uh, n plus 1 over 2 squared, or something like it, right? Uh, it's, it's not necessarily going to be this exactly. I think actually it's one of the proofs related to that. But regardless of which proof it is, uh, once you have one, uh, you can start to build more complicated patterns and perceive more complicated patterns and have the relationship that describes them in a really, I guess, succinct way. So in short, uh, kind of do a couple practice proofs. See if you can prove uh, that certain patterns obey a, a relationship. And see if you can get the, the kind of formula for the next number in your particular series, whatever it is, if it is a deductive, uh, or, or, or if, if the series is a kind of necessary uh, part of, of, of mathematics, so that there's no kind of guesswork or likelihood involved. If there is likelihood involved, you know, we'll see you next video when we talk about induction more generally. Uh, but again, uh, go see if you can find some examples. Like see about uh, I, one squared plus two squared plus three squared, etc. See if you can d derive the same thing using the same kind of argument. And as usual, uh, if you have any questions or would like to see more examples of these kinds of arguments, feel free to ask for them. Although, uh, I'd encourage you to learn more uh, connect or logical connectives before you do so. Um, it certainly makes it easier to prove. Uh, and uh, as usual, there should be a Bitcoin donation address somewhere at the bottom here to, uh, I, to support this video series so that we can continue it to the very end. Uh, and uh, hopefully enjoy. See you next time. Actually, do we have any questions from the audience? No questions. Okay, perfect. See you next video.